let's stand. Let's welcome the Spirit of the Lord in this place today.
to read Psalm 138 to you. It says, I give thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the God, small g. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness. For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. On the day I called you, you answered me. Praise you, Lord. It says you encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you. Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways for the glory of the Lord is very great. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble. Praise God. But he keeps his distance from the proud. Be careful. Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Father, we thank you that your love endures. Lord, we thank you that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow, every tongue will confess. God, you are good. We praise you. Would you be pleased this morning? Praise and 
Praise the Lord. Well, good morning. We're glad you're here at Lifehouse Church. My name's Rob. If this is your very first time to Lifehouse, welcome, you guys. We're so glad you're here. And um, I was able to go home. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Alaska, so I, I brought some bitter cold weather with me, all right? But, uh, but that's what, that's, uh, we're, we're excited that you're here today. If you walked in for the very first time today, you probably walked right past our first time uh, guest tent. So um, if you did not receive your free gift this morning on your way out, please do so. We have something for you and your family. And we want to make sure you feel welcome today. And I, I really hope you do. I hope you feel so welcome you come back next week. We're, we're not... Um, we don't take it lightly that you're here today because I know there's a bunch of great churches in our area that preach and teach the word of God. And we, we really are humbled that you take a little bit of time to come join us this morning. So church, let's welcome our first time guests. We're glad you guys are here today. You could be seated. Good morning. My name is Rajiv Danaude. In case you're wondering how to spell, uh, pronounce that last name. <laughs> And on that screen are many ways of giving. We do have the online method. We have the uh, Lifehouse app. And we also have the text method. And we are about to collect the offering now uh, as part of this worship service. I'm going to read uh, two verses from Proverbs. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. In this portion of the scriptures, God pairs a command to honor him with our wealth and our first fruits with a promise of plenty. Now, many preachers have used verses like this to base their prosperity gospel, but uh, the important thing to remember is that when we try to set up a transactional arrangement like that, God sees right through us. God is never fooled. Uh, when Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, that is a transactional arrangement. But the second part of that verse, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, shows us what is God's idea of giving. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8 gives us a perspective that may give us more insight into this uh, piece of scripture that I just read. And it reads, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, you may be able to abound in every good work. When we give to God, it is not with the expectation that he will do something for us in return. He certainly blesses us when we bless him with our gifts, if, whether it's our talents, with our time, or with our money. And God does not do anything randomly. He blesses us so that we may continue to abound in every good work. So, and one of those good works is giving. And giving needs to be an expression of our love and worship towards God. So, in conclusion, our giving needs to be one, honoring to God. And that needs to be the ultimate motive for everything that we do. Secondly, it has to be deliberate. That means we need to put our thought into it and make a decision that we are going to give. And thirdly, it has to be enthusiastic for God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you. As the ushers are coming forward, let's pray for this offering, all right? Father, Lord, we know that every good gift is from you. And Lord, as we give back what already belongs to you, Lord, would you take it? Would you multiply it? Would you use it for your kingdom's sake? In Jesus' name. Good morning, Lifehouse. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Jason Kreidler, and I'm humbled uh, to serve as an elder here with me and my family. Uh, and we're going to move into a time uh, where we get to take communion. Uh, and I love this time, um, not, not just for myself, but for us as a, as a body of Christ, to proclaim what Jesus did on the cross for us. So I'm just going to read quickly here from Matthew chapter 26. 
It says, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It's shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. And after singing psalms, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus took um, what had been for years and years and years meant as, as a symbol of something that God had done for his people in the past. They were celebrating the Passover. Um, and, and Jesus took that and he changed it and he made it new and fresh and said, look, from now on, you're not going to celebrate something that God did in the past. You're going to celebrate something that I'm about to do, something new. He established a new covenant. And that's what we celebrate every single time we come forward and we take communion. We proclaim the name of Christ and what he did on the cross and what his body and his blood means for us to the rest of the world. But Paul also, as the church started this process, and over the first few years, as believers started taking the bread and the wine and drinking it, Paul recognized that something had gone wrong, and he gives a warning as well in 1 Corinthians. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of sin against the body of the and the blood of the Lord. So a man should examine himself, and in this way he should eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we see that we don't just come and and take a piece of bread and, and dip it in the cup. Beforehand, we should examine ourselves. Like Paul makes that very clear. It says, For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to encourage you, before you even come forward, let's take a moment. Let's examine our hearts. Let's make sure we're right with God. Let's make sure that there's nothing right now hindering um, our relationship with Christ. And if there is, I would ask you just to, to sit and repent and, and, and give that to God before you even come forward. And this also makes it very clear that, that, that this is a proclamation for believers, of what Jesus did for you personally in your life. And if that's not you yet, if you haven't made that decision, I would ask you just to, just to sit and reflect and watch as those that do believe proclaim what Christ has done. And just as we come, I'd ask you to stay to the right as you come and go. Um, there's going to be stations in the front, stations in the back. Everything's gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about that. But examine your heart. Start that right now. Start examining your hearts. Make sure that you, you, you take this in a worthy manner. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. I praise you for what you did on the cross. Father, I praise you that you gave your body and your blood for us, something we could never do for ourselves. Father, I thank you that you've given this to us so that we constantly come back and remember what you did. And so this morning, Father, I pray that in every heart and in every mind who is here that has placed their faith and trust in you, Father, I pray that you would renew that sense of what what you did in our lives, something we could never do for ourselves, Lord. Refresh that. Bring back the joy of our salvation, Father. We praise you and we thank you for everything that you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus, the image.
sacrifice you made for us doesn't make sense. We don't understand it. Lord, why would you humble yourself in such a way for us? Lord, we don't know, but we are so glad you did. Lord, help us today. Focus on you. Focus on your word as your word is open. Lord, let it fill us. Let it make a dead heart awake today. In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Actually, I want you to remain standing. <laughs> Rather than have you sit down and stand up, we're going to read the passage. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, uh, to turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 54. As we transition to the time of our service where the word of God is proclaimed through the preaching of a servant, sermon. excuse me. Just to remind you as we prepare to read this text together, we're standing uh, in acknowledgement corporately together as a church family in reverence. That's why we stand. We believe this to be God's holy word. And as such, we stand in honor of God's holy word. So Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 11, 37, excuse me, we are told that while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So Jesus went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seed in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers asks him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And Jesus said, woe to you, lawyers, also. For you load people with burdens, hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed, so you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore, also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. And woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. And as Jesus went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Oh Lord, would you bless the reading of your holy word. Amen. Now you can be seated. In this passage, Jesus boldly confronts and I believe lovingly condemns mere religion, empty religion. That is religion that just goes through the motions and at the end of the day, in the eyes of God, I believe is detestable religion. Understand religion in and of itself affords nothing. Understand that mere religion, religion does not make one righteous. The Bible tells us our righteousness in and of ourselves, no matter how religious, quote unquote, we are, is as filthy rags. In other words, it's not righteousness. They're not righteous rags, they're filthy rags. Religion does not make one righteous. Rather, what is communicated in Scripture, specifically in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament, is that a relationship with Jesus is what affords one a righteous standing before a holy, righteous God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, become sin. 
on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but by his doing, not our doing, by his doing, Jesus Christ has become to us the wisdom of God and not just that righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In Luke 11, 37 through 53, Jesus makes it abundantly clear, at least I believe he makes it abundantly clear, that mere religion at the end of the day is miserable religion. By mention, he mentions six specific associated miseries, I believe, of mere religion. And for what it's worth, due to the nature of this conversation we see here in Luke 11, I don't believe these six miseries that are mentioned. He says, woe to you six times. I don't believe they're a comprehensive list, but simply an off-the-cuff list. Jesus is not having a teaching time. He's not preaching these words. He's just having a conversation. He's just giving examples of the miseries of mere religion. Nevertheless, understand that while Jesus' conversation may seem to be off the cuff and just seem to be a conversation or casual, it is absolutely confrontive. It's a passionate conversation. Do not miss that there are lots of exclamation points in throughout this passage, this text, this conversation. So undoubtedly, Jesus, the Son of God, who left his position, who emptied himself, who came, he, his voice was raised when he was saying these words. As he worked his way through these six woeful miseries connected to mere religion. We're going to work through them real quickly. I believe the first one is wrong mentalities. The wrong mentalities associated with mere religion. The wrong motives, wrong perceptions, wrong rules, wrong responses, and wrong results. There's six of them, three more than the usual three points that I have in a sermon. But listen, if we could just sum it up, there's really just one point. And that is that mere religion is just simply wrong religion. It's woeful religion. As we begin this morning, I want to ask you to consider the question, are you religious? Think about for a moment how you participated in, in the Lord's Supper. I loved what Jason said. He, he is obviously not merely religious. He has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Evidence, not just because of my relationship with Jason and I see how he lives out his life. I can tell by what he talked about. I mean, he has something to remember when he talks about remembering the blood of Jesus Christ that washed his sins away. He has something to remember and be excited about as he talked about as we take and we partake, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We proclaim the gospel, the same gospel that saved us. And it's, it's an exciting opportunity. It's not something that we just go through the motions and do in a rote, ritualistic manner. No. Mere religion is wrong religion. I ask you, are you religious? The Jews of Jesus' day were religious. The Pharisees specifically and the scribes, we see them mentioned in this passage, they were among the Jews who were very religious in Jesus' day. They, though, the Pharisees and the scribes were very religious. They were perhaps the most religious among a religious people. It was, in fact, we're told in Luke eleven thirty seven, 37, a Pharisee who asked Jesus to dine with him. My heart's a little bit tender as I think about this passage. I often say to you how when studying scripture and reading through the Bible, I often picture people associated with characters in the Bible. For instance, there's John the Baptist sitting right there, Big Ben. But the reason my heart is tender is because when I read this passage, I see myself before Christ. I was religious. I thought it was good successful, better than others, condemning. I knew a lot about God, but I didn't know God. And so this text, this passage really hits home for me. It takes me back to that time that I was oblivious, clueless, I thought I was so right. I was dead wrong. And I'm burdened because I believe that there are a lot of people who are not right. A lot.
lot of people who know a lot about Jesus, but who don't know Jesus. And they try so hard and they work so hard, just like I did. And maybe they're successful, maybe they're not. But they're wrong. So yeah, this passage hits home for me. Maybe it hits home for you. You see, I see these exclamation points throughout this text. I picture Jesus angry, but I also picture him so loving. I hear those woes. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, six times in this passage. I believe they're loving woes. Jesus was not okay with the fact that this Pharisee was wrong. He was headed in the wrong direction. And not only was he headed in the wrong direction, other people were following him. He was taking other people in the wrong direction. Jesus was not okay with that. That's why we see exclamation points. If you remember what leads up to this passage, just to give some context, Jesus delivered a man that was possessed by a demon. It was incredible. The man was mute. He could not hear. He could not speak at all. He was controlled by a demon, demon demon-possessed. But Jesus, in an instant, sets this man free, delivers him. He did what no one else could do. And in such a way that the people that were there, he didn't do it in some back room around a corner. No, he wanted people to see, to validate, yes, I'm the son of God, the Christ. Place your faith and trust in me. He did what no one else could do. The people that were there, that witnessed it, they marveled, we're told. However, some who were there, if you remember, ridiculously reasoned. Reasoned it away. They said, oh, they couldn't deny the miracle, the deliverance. So they just said, oh, he did it by the power of Satan. Some who were there continued to deny the undeniable. They just would never be satisfied. And I see people, and as I think of them, I think of people that I've had conversations with even in the past week. Will anything ever be enough? What will, what, Jesus, what do you have to do? God, what do you have to do to convince this person to show them that you are who you claim to be, that there's a way for them, that they can know you? These people, no matter what Jesus did, No matter what Jesus said, they said, we need more. And so we're told they kept seeking from Jesus a sign from heaven. They continued to test Jesus. Mind you, Jesus had already gone way above and beyond providing, validating proofs that he was in fact the Christ. The truth was Jesus had long before passed any tests, aced them. No more signs were needed. However, what was needed was for these people to repent of their willful and continued rejection of Jesus Christ. What they should have done right then and there was bow before him, was worship him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, we just sang about him. He was right there before them with arms open wide. But they refused. They were so religious. And they were so wrong. Jesus said they were spiritually blind and therefore full of darkness. And so in the midst of that confrontation, Luke 37 tells us that while Jesus was speaking, that's that's what's going on, a Pharisee asked Jesus to dine with him. So Jesus went in and reclined at the table. That's how they did it in that culture. They did not sit around a table. They reclined around a table. So picture the scene in your mind. It was intimate. Jesus literally laid back. He reclined at the table. Now, likely there were others there around the table, at least a small group of people, but the man who invited Jesus to dine with him was a Pharisee. Again, a man among that segment of their society that was known for being very religious, the most religious. The name Pharisee comes from the Hebrew word parash, what means to separate. So they were pretty much separated from everybody else. Really, they isolated themselves from everyone else, the rest of the world, society. And they lived up to their name. Religiously speaking, they placed themselves up on this high pedestal for all to see and marvel at. Wow, look at them. 
They're religious. They're devoted. They devoted themselves to about 6,000 religious laws and traditions, a seemingly endless list of to-dos and don't-dos that in their mind made them righteous. As such, they viewed and promoted themselves as pure, as clean, nice and shiny. And they felt that to come in contact with the rest of the society around them, the world, the people that God loved, that, that they were very religious, they thought that would make them defiled, that would make them unclean. One tradition they held to was a ritualistic washing. And any time a Pharisee would come in contact or having been in contact with the outside world around them, they were thereby defiled. And so any time they would prepare to eat the food that came from the outside world, they would uh, protect themselves from this defilement by washing, quote unquote, themselves. And it was a religious washing. It wasn't simply just washing their hands because they had dirty hands that needed to be washed before they ate. It was, so, it was ritualistic. It was religious. It was tradition. It was all about them cleansing themselves from the defiling outside world and restoring the righteousness and the purity and the holiness that they had been a part of that was a part of their religion. It was outlined in their Mishnah and even to the specific amount of water that they were to use when doing this, it was one and a half eggs shells worth of water to be exact. And they would hold up their hands and they would pour it on the tips, the water on the tips of the finger. The water would then run down to the wrists. And then after that, they would ritualistically wash their hands in order to restore themselves to a place of holiness, a place of purity and and righteousness. And they did this religiously and ritualistically. To not do it was unthinkable. So verse 38, this Pharisee was astonished. We're told that he was amazed to see that Jesus did not first wash in the way that they washed before dinner. I mean, he couldn't believe it. His jaw was on the ground. He was astonished. And listen, don't think that this was about hygiene. Some of you moms are out there. I can't believe Jesus didn't wash his hands. We were trying to teach our kids to wash our hands, but that's not what this was about. It wasn't about hygiene. This was about religion. This man was astonished. Literally in the same way that the people marveled in Luke eleven fourteen 14 when Jesus cast out the demon, this man was astonished. The same Greek word was used in both instances. He was astonished. He marveled that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. He was amazed. Literally astonished because to the Pharisees, washing like that was a huge deal. It kept them. It made them righteous in a world that was full of wrong. The man's astonishment was likely, picture him, it was written all over his face. However, Jesus knew what he was thinking. He didn't have to say what he was thinking. Again, he was astonished. It was written all over his face. And so Jesus spoke. And again, now washing hands is not simply washing one's hands. That's good to do that. This, is, this, this, this had religious implications. So in response to that idea, Jesus says to him, likely pointing to uh, cups and dishes that were on the table, verse 39, he, the Lord Jesus, said to the man, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside are full of greed and wickedness. He's saying you're like a dish that was only washed on the outside and as such is still inside, dirty, nasty, really. really. You're full of greed and wickedness. Anyone ever, anyone who has teens that you tried to teach do the dishes, I know you can relate to me, but you ever grab a cup and use the cup, you're so thirsty, you fill that cup up with water and you drink the water only to know that there's something floating around in the water that you're drinking? You realize maybe, and you wonder, is that rotten milk? Is that, you know, what is that? Rotten orange juice, what is that? Don't forget to wash the inside. You tell your kid, you teach your kid. Jesus is saying, you Pharisees are like that. On the outside, you're good. Yeah, you look nice and shiny, but on the inside, you are full of greed and wickedness. You are not what you think you are. You are not what you profess to be. Jesus said in verse 40, you fools. You fools, there's an explanation here. And listen, I don't think this is condemning in the way that Jesus hated these people. Jesus was not okay with the fact that these people were believing what they were believing. They were deceived. They were believing a lie. They were misguided. They did not understand. He had tried to tell them the truth, but in their greed and wickedness, in their pride, they simply would not hear the truth. They would not receive and respond to the truth that could save them. He said, you fools. 
You Pharisees are fools. All this washing day in and day out. You're so committed to this washing, ritualistic washing. You may think that by washing your hands, can you, you think that you're clean before a holy, righteous God because you pour one and a half eggs worth of water on your hands and it runs down your finger and you do it twice a day. You think that you're clean? Do you think God doesn't see your heart? That God doesn't know what's on the inside? Do you even know what's on the inside? Fact is, you may not even know what's on the inside. And Jesus was there to tell them what was on the inside. It needed to be cleansed. It needed to be washed. The Lord said to them, did he, not he who made the outside make the inside also and listen, you want it all clean before a holy, righteous God. He is holy. He says, be holy, for I am holy. The inside is what really matters. Don't forget, don't neglect the inside. Listen, sin stains. Sin defiles. The Bible says the wages, as Rajiv said earlier, the wages of sin is death. In Galatians, it says, he who sows seeds to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Those Pharisees felt pretty good about themselves. Jesus said, the truth is, inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You're not clean like you think you are. Be astonished, exclamation point. I'm sorry to be picking on my teens, but all the time, Tammy and I tell our teens to clean their rooms, right? And there are times when it looked good, right? When you open the door, you look in, everything looks good, bed's made. Then you look under the bed or in the closet, and sometimes you don't even need to look under the bed or in the closet because you can smell what's under the bed and in the closet. Nasty. Listen, that's what God sees. That's what God smells in some regards. It's something Febreze can't cover. The wages of sin is death. You ever smelled death? He who sows seeds to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Febreze can't hide corruption. Did not he who make the outside make the inside also? Verse 41, I believe Jesus is encouraging us to not forget, not neglect the inside. He says, give his alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean for you. In other words, start from the inside. Don't neglect the inside. Start with the inside. You want to honor God. You want to be clean, righteous. Do it from the inside out. Start with your heart. The thing is, only the Lord can accomplish that kind of cleansing for us because you can't get in there yourself. And he can. That's what's so amazing. By his grace, he can and he will if you let him if you trust him to. In the Old Testament in 2 Samuel, King David, thanks to help from the prophet Nathan, came to make him aware of what Jesus, in G the Pharisees in Jesus' day were not aware of, they were oblivious to. The prophet Nathan confronted David about his sin with Bathsheba. Remember, he committed adultery with her, even killed her husband. And after King David thought things were good, he just swept things under the carpet, made things clean, made things look, appear as they were good, but they were not okay. God was not okay. In the last sentence of 2 Samuel 11, it tells us the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. He could sweep it under the carpet, but Jesus, God, but God knew it was there. He smelled it. It was not a fragrant aroma. It was stanky. And unlike the Pharisees, King David responded to Nathan's confrontation by repenting. He first acknowledged his sin. David admitted to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He knew that he needed a clean heart. He knew that he needed to forgiveness. He needed the Lord's help to do what he could not himself do. And so he wrote a beautiful psalm, Psalm 51. And he humbly prayed, oh Lord, have mercy on me. 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, not because I deserve it, but because of who you have revealed yourself to be, in other words. And he said, in that regard, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, he prayed, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I can't get rid of it. I can't take enough showers and do enough ritualistic cleansings to get these things away from me. I know my sin is always before me, and I know Know that against you, a holy, righteous God, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so he says, you are right in your verdict. I know what I deserve. And then he cried out to the Lord to do for him what he could not do for himself. He said, oh Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And incredibly, the Lord answered David's prayer. He he was known as a man after God's own heart. Friend, are you like David? Do you know the importance of a clean heart before a holy, righteous God? Just like David, you and I can repent. Just like David, we can look to the Lord in faith and he can make us clean where we're not clean. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, what can wash away our sins? As the hymn says, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. His blood, as Hebrews communicates, is sufficient for all sins for all time. I love 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 6, verse 9. After listing these detestable sins, uh, fornication, homosexuality, adultery, murder, he says, listen, he's talking to believers. He says, some of you were those things. That's who you were, but now you are washed. He says, you were washed, sanctified. You were justified, not because you did something, because Jesus did it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself. He cleaned you from the inside out. That's who you were, but understand and know what you are. And that is washed. He took care of that inside in a way that you could never take care of the inside. God made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Jesus told the Pharisee in Luke eleven forty one, 41, give his alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean for you. You want to be clean before God? Right with God, start with the heart. Don't be foolish like the Pharisee, like I used to be. Listen to the woes that he says in this passage. Don't be merely religious and engage in hand washings or anything else of the like. Understand that apart from Christ, you are not righteous. Mere religion in the end will bring you nothing but mere misery. The Pharisees thought in their piety, their religious devotion, that they were separated from the world. But in reality, they were separated from God and there's sin and sinfulness. They were wrong. Jesus told them, you are wrong. Inside, you're full of greed and wickedness. You are not right. You're so wrong. And that played out in their first wrong mentalities. He says, woe to you Pharisees, exclamation point. Woe was an exclamation of grief and distress. It was an utter denunciation. Don't miss the explanation points. I believe it's because he loved them. He was angry. He hated sin, but he was angry, frustrated for them, frustrated with what they, how they were influencing other people. It's a strong, harsh rebuke from Jesus. Listen, there's no way that Jesus' voice was not raised in this conversation. I believe his heart was racing. I believe his face perhaps was even red. He's calling out to these very religious men, these wrong men, the most religious men of that society, and telling them you have the wrong mentality. Woe to you Pharisees, you tithe, mint, and rue in every herb. In other words, you are so religious, and you're so careful to tithe, as in give one-tenth of everything into the storehouse to the penny, even things such as insignificant things like your herbs. You tithe every penny, but in doing so, it's just religious activity. You're just going through the motions, and I know so because you neglect justice and the love of God. Mind you, Jesus tells them, you should tithe. He says, you have, these you ought to have done, but without neglecting the others. Understand, God doesn't want our money or need our money. What he wants is our hearts. 
Giving our tithes does not God make God love us more than he already does or make us more righteous. God does not want our monotonous, meticulous obligation. He wants our hearts. And when he has our hearts, I believe those other things will follow. We will love God. We will love our neighbors. We will love justice. We will care for those. We will be generous. Giving and generosity flows from a heart that knows and loves the Lord. We'll look at things differently than giving the tithing to the penny and not a penny more. That's a different mentality. We see the right mentality of people who know Jesus and who love Jesus in 2 Corinthians chapter, or chapter 8. Paul talks about these believers in Macedonia. He knew them well. And it says their abundant joy and love for the Lord overflowed in a wealth of generosity. And Paul says, testifying, knowing them, he says that they gave according to their means and beyond their means of their own accord. Paul says they even begged him for the favor, the grace of taking part in that offering. They couldn't wait to give. They couldn't wait to be a part of encouraging other believers in Jerusalem. They were generous. King David was generous. He led his people in being generous to build the temple. His mentality, again, was very different than the Pharisees. He didn't just give his tithe down to the penny, even on his herbs. No, it says, and he told the people, listen, I want you to give, but I want you to give willingly. He led the way, and they did so. In 2 Chronicles 29, it says they all did. Every one of them, David led the way, and all the people, they gave willingly with their whole heart. And they offered their offerings freely, not under compulsion, like Rajiv was talking about earlier. They gave because they loved God. They were excited to be a part of what God was doing in and among them. They wanted to honor God, and so they couldn't wait to give. They gave freely. As they gave, they did not neglect the love of God. They gave because of their love for God. That's the type of giving that pleases the Lord, not just religious giving. That's not what God wants. John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus says the hour is here, is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking, seeking people like that to worship him. That's how I want us to give here at Lifehouse Church. God forbid that anyone would ever feel guilted into giving. No, let us worship and give and serve and live. It's not just the mentality associated with giving. It's how we live our lives. Let's live our lives in such a way that express in tangible ways, Lord, we love you, and Lord, we trust you. That's the wrong mentality when we give like they were giving here. And then we see wrong motives. Jesus says in verse 43 again, Woe to you, Pharisees! Exclamation point. For you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Listen, they just wanted to be seen. They, when they gathered for worship religiously, I mean, they didn't miss a time when it was time to gather because it was an opportunity for them to elevate themselves. They loved the attention that they got in the marketplaces. They would wear their robes and they would strategically stop when it was time to pray. And they just, oh, I just happened to be on the street corner where more people can see me. And I'm in my, my religious robes and they would offer up these wordy prayers just to show people how much they knew about scripture. And Jesus actually talked about that earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't pray like that. Don't be like that. They've got their reward. Don't be like that. Those seats at the, at the synagogue. They actually had seats on the platform, and that's what it's talking about. They wanted to sit on the platform. Their goal was to sit on the platform for people to say, wow, look at them. They're religious. It was all about them climbing the religious ladder of success. The thing is, people can do the same here and come to church for themselves to be entertained, and when they're not entertained, they're out. They can come to church for business relations and connections and opportunities, and when those don't happen, they move on to the next church. People can gather in the name of Jesus, in the name of religion for social reasons, but when they're not making the connections that they feel they should be making and, and they're not being fed the way they feel like they should be fed, spoon-fed, they leave. These Pharisees, to them, gathering was all about them when it should never be about us but rather all about Jesus. It should be all about lifting up and magnifying and worshiping the name of Jesus and being a part of the body of Christ, fully functioning members of the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter four says that when every part or every member of the body of Christ is working properly, doing what they're supposed to be doing, it builds the body, his body up in love. We're to encourage one another as we gather. It's not just we're encur everyone encourage you, we're to encourage one another. We're to bear one another's burdens as we gather. Jesus says, you want to know who my disciples are? You'll know them by their love for one another. 
It's reciprocal. I love how John the Baptist put it. It wasn't about him. Remember what he said? He wanted Jesus to increase. He said, he must increase and I must decrease. That should be our mentality when we come and gather for worship. That's the right mentality opposed to the wrong that we see. They had wrong perceptions. Next in verse 44, he says, woe to you for you're like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. The Pharisees, they, in their tradition said that if you touched something that was dead or an, a grave or anything, you were defiled for seven days. You couldn't gather for worship. And Jesus is saying, you're like unmarked graves. People are defiling themselves just by coming in contact with you. You're leading them astray. You're like unmarked graves and you're oblivious to that. Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me. Understand, religion does not afford anyone righteousness. Righteousness is found through Jesus. The next thing we see is wrong rules. Jesus is confronting this Pharisee, and then one of the lawyers in verse 45 answered him. The lawyer or the scribes were those in that society that interpreted the law and applied the law to how they lived their lives. 6,000 of them, if you remember. They applied the law, and Jesus said, woe to you lawyers also, because he said, you're insulting us too, Jesus. He says, yes, woe to you lawyers also. He wasn't okay with mere religions and empty rituals and rules. He told the lawyer, you load people with burdens too hard to bear. And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. It's not what Jesus does, right? Remember Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where Jesus says, listen, all you, all you people who have been spinning your wheels and getting nowhere, all you people who are too weighed down by religion or whatever else, he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit. And if you come to me, you'll find rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These Pharisees were laying burdens on people. Jesus wants us to find rest in him. He is the way. Instead of loading us up with burdens, the Lord daily loads us with benefits. And that doesn't mean that following Christ is easy. It's hard. But he gives us the blessing of himself. And he is the friend that sits closer than a brother. And he will never, no, never, ever leave us or forsake us. No. What we're a part of in and through Christ is not religion. It is a relationship. John says in 1 John chapter 1, he says, Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, who interestingly enough was a Pharisee himself, who had been a part of their mere religion and then eventually saw the light by the grace of God, he testifies in Philippians chapter 3 referring to those things. He said, whatever gain I had, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. He says in verse 8, indeed, I count everything, every bit of it as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. All that stuff got me nowhere. Jesus is taking me everywhere. He says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I count them all as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Next, we see wrong response. Verse 47, Jesus again says, woe to you. He told them, you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. God sent prophets to his people throughout the Old Testament to proclaim truth to them, to say, woe to them, you're off track, repent, turn back to me. But they would not listen. They would not receive the word that God sent them because he loved them. Instead, they killed the prophets that God sent them, and they rejected the word through them. And that's what these Pharisees were doing. He's saying, you're just like your father's. You should know their testimony. You should learn from their testimony, but you're not. You're following suit. He says in verse 48, you're witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers for they killed the prophets and you build their tombs. You know all about it. The wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, this greedy and wicked generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar of the sanctuary. They should have known, they should have learned their lesson, but they did not. It was a wrong response. Instead of receiving and accepting God's word, they rejected it. Yes, God's word sometimes is a hard pill to swallow. Yes, it is a double-edged sword. Sometimes it cuts. It doesn't feel good, but it is God's word. And it should be responded to with obedience. 
in reverence. We should tremble at his word. And then last, what mere religion leads to is wrong results. Mere religion, this religion, all this effort, cleansing two times a day, every time they went out into the world, it got them nowhere. He says in verse 52, woe to you lawyers. He said the reality is what you've done instead of helping in regards to the kingdom, instead of showing people the way you led them astray, instead of helping people into God's kingdom, you're hurting, instead of showing people the way you're leading them astray. And their merely religious rituals and rules did nothing. He said you've taken away what you've done in your rituals and rules and your mentality and all those wrong ways of thinking. You've taken away the key of knowledge. Instead of building a bridge, you've burned a bridge. And he says you did not enter yourself and you've hindered those who were entering. So not only are you not entering, those people looking to you for wisdom and knowledge are not entering either because they're following your example. Jesus was upset. These religious men were not only far from God, they were hindering others. They were obstacles. Jesus was not okay with that. Understand, that's what mere religion does. God forbid that you would be one of them. Romans 1.18, it's all about a relationship with Jesus Christ as we bring it to a close. Look, these people were so mad, so offended, they wouldn't receive. It says at this point, starting in verse 53, they, they wanted Jesus to, to say something that would be enough to charge them so that they could lead to the crucifixion. And that's exactly how it played out. They crucified Jesus. They would not receive his word, this gospel. The gospel, though, Romans 1.18, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who would believe it. What religion cannot do for you, the gospel can do for you. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And he cleans us from the inside out. Changes us, transforms us, conforms us into his image. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can look to God and we can pray to God and we can ask him to search our hearts And when we do it by faith and in Christ, we can know that what he finds there, he will not condemn there. He'll cleanse there. If we confess our sins, again, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says in Romans 10, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Is he your righteousness? Have you placed your faith and trust in him? Have you been going through the motions, doing rituals, thinking because you were baptized or because you participate in communion, because you gather and assemble on a Sunday morning here or there, that you're saved, that you're righteous before holy, righteous God? God forbid that that would be your mentality, that that would be your thinking. Salvation is found only in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is something to celebrate. That is something to, to, to worship the Lord for. He is worthy of worship. Listen, let's make it all about Jesus Christ. God forbid that anyone would enter those doors and think anything other than that reality, that it is through Jesus Christ, not Lifehouse Church, not Pastor Mark, not Pastor Danny and LSM. It is through Jesus Christ that one is considered righteous before a holy, righteous God and is saved. I pray that you'll consider this testimony Perhaps you're a religious person, like I was, like this man was. Don't fall into that trap. Call upon the name of Jesus. Place your faith and trust in him. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, so many years ago, you opened my blind eyes to see the truth of the gospel. And it's sobering for me to think about where I was and how good I felt about myself when inside I was greedy and wicked, just like this man. I was all about myself and elevating myself and oh, how I loved the attention and the lauding that I got from being up in front of people and and oh, how I searched and, and, and sought opportunities to be noticed by people for how holy or righteous I was and compared to other people. Lord, I, I thank you. For instead of condemning me, instead of giving me what I deserve, when you saw the truth, the reality of my heart, you showed me grace. 
and your arms were open to me and all I had to do was place my faith and trust in you, repenting of those wicked, evil thoughts and ways. I'm so thankful that I am washed. I know I'm not perfect, Lord. I know I'm still learning and growing, but I'm so thankful that you're patient with me. But I praise you and I thank you that you washed my sins away and that because of Jesus, a sinner like me can be considered righteous before you, God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here and in your sin and sinfulness, according to God's word, you are far from God, not near him. I pray that you will be encouraged and know that no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, that right now you have the opportunity to repent of your sin and turn to the Lord, place your faith and trust in Jesus and be saved. 